go. Mm-mm-mm. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, uh, we are starting this segment. <laughs> Taste We've it. never eaten ice cream on oh, this podcast Jesus. before. Yeah, uh, Ben and Jerry's Justice Remix. It, and it seems like this would have been a good ice cream to eat during Halloween because I got a little pumpkin or yeah, nutmeg flavor yeah, in it. Yeah, it's got that little spicy mm. kick to it. But with the sugar. Listen. <laughs> We can't get so much in the ice cream, we ignore our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Ben and Jerry's from Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, as well as Chris Miller, who is the what? Head of Global Activism Activism for Ben and Jerry's. Uh, Activism. Activism. What did I say? No, no, no. I had said it, or I had started the acquisition, okay. and, I, and then it's activism. Activism. Yeah, it's activism. Yeah, because they get people active. They use the ice cream to get people active in social justice issues, make people aware. They help people sign petitions. We've seen it first To time. get Amendment 4 on the ballot, yep. and then help get people to turn out to vote for Amendment 4. And that's why me and you... And 1.4 million other people in Florida. Come on, now we have the right it. to vote. And as a matter of fact, today, Ben and Jerry and Chris, today is election day here in uh, the city of Orlando where we're based. And we got returning we're, citizens voting. That, that vote, some of them going to be voting for the very first time. And, and it's partially due to your support and your effort. So thank you all so much. And let's dig in. What do you think? Uh, I love it. I love it. So... Um, oh, go ahead, Des. All right. Well, well, listen, I'm fast forwarding. Hey, you guys, you remember in May 2020, this George Floyd, uh, when George Floyd was murdered in Min- Minneapolis, right? And the country erupted in the protests, right? You, ben, I think it was you that decided to travel down to D.C. to join the protests. Why did you go? Yep. Yep. I, I was there. I, <clears throat> you know, what was amazing about uh, that protest was... I mean, first of all, it was in, incredibly peaceful and it was beautiful because it was black led and and it was beautiful because it was a racial justice protest and it was mostly white people there. And uh, it and and there was, you know, such a sense of camaraderie and and care for each other. And there was also an incredible militarized police presence. I mean, we we just couldn't believe it. Uh, I mean, it it didn't look like police to me. I mean, it looked like military, and and they were out. I I, I just couldn't imagine it. You know how many of them there were, and that's. But you that's know, what I, they, I was actually. Well, wasn't they, they? Those are the same people that was there at the. Uh... At the insurrection at the Capitol, right? I mean, um, did we? Well, I mean, that, was, the, that was exactly it was the what same the force? difference was. Wait, wait, wait. It was at, a difference? At the insurrection at the Capitol, there was like no police. There was like no military. There was. Oh. Yeah, yeah. There was like. <laughs> This is this is something that right like is it I'm controversial to say this or not? I mean, my ice cream. If the Capitol <laughs> Hill police thought that the folks on January six were Black Lives Matter, I'm pretty sure they would have shown up in a stronger force, right? Is that is that controversial to say? No, no doubt, right? In my mind, no I doubt mean, in my mind. Clear. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it didn't come from me. It came from Neil, and he's a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> mm. Now yeah, we have I mean, silence. <laughs> I, mean, I came there. I had I had two sides. Uh, one was something about how we will only have justice when those who are not as oppressed are as outraged as those who are. And the other sign, uh, I I held up the next day in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, calling on them to overturn qualified immunity. And uh, Jerry and I have been campaigning uh, on that issue. Uh, You know, qualified immunity is essentially uh, the legal doctrine that makes cops immune from from prosecution when they violate your constitutional or civil rights. I mean, it's, it's... kind of amazing. I mean, it, if I were to haul off and punch you in the face, you could sue me. If a cop did it, your case would be thrown out of court. And, uh, you know, that's the reason why we see 
so many instances where cops abuse, brutalize, and even murder people, and they get away with it. They, they are either not prosecuted, or if they are prosecuted, they end up with a slap on the wrist. And yeah, and be, be- yeah, we talked about this uh, during our last podcast, too. And Ben, you've got a new book coming out. Right. Or uh, Above the Law, How Qualified Immunity Protects Violent Police. I think Des has got a book out. There's a lot of passion behind uh, writing that. I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, there's lots of different elements of police reform. Uh, why did you ultimately focus on qualified immunity? Because qualified immunity is about accountability. It's about holding police accountable for their actions. And it was incredible to us when we discovered that there there is this legal doctrine that makes it so that police are not accountable for their actions uh, you know the, the 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 legal theory is based on ignorance of the law that uh the law th- this legal theory assumes that cops don't know the law and uh you know, we all grew up being taught that ignorance of, of the law is no excuse. Wait, hold up, back up, hold up, hold yeah, up, hold you, up. You struck both you, Desmond hold and up, I hold there. Hold up, hold up, hold up, wait a minute. You're, you're trying to tell me that there's a theory that says that cops don't know the law, but yet they are the enforcers of the law? So how could they enforce something that they don't know anything about? Exactly. It's crazy. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. And uh, and that's why it ought to be overturned. I mean, the idea that a law enforcement officer is not expected to know the law. It it's unbelievable. (laughs) But that is how absurd and how crazy it is. No, So I got listen, I got to I got to tell you that you have some folks you have some folks that argue that, you know, you need qualified immunity because that is what gives police officers enough room to actually do their job. And if they're always worried about being sued, they're not going to be effective as effective. Right. And now you're here saying something different, but what do you say to people that say that? We say that cops have to follow the law (laughs) and, and if they don't follow the law, they should be prosecuted and they should be held accountable. And if if what cops are saying is that in order for me to do my job, I have to break the law, that don't cut it. That's that should that's illegal. Police have strong constitutional protections as it is, and the only police that benefit from qualified immunity are bad cops who are breaking the law. You know, it's interesting. Ben and I are the co-chairs of the campaign to end qualified immunity. And we are a coalition of about two dozen national advocacy groups that spans the ideological spectrum. So you have the ACLU, you have the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, you have the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and then you also have libertarian groups like the Cato Institute, you have Americans for Prosperity, you have the Institute for Justice. So there are people all along who want to end this, as Ben says, ridiculous doctrine. And the only people who want to keep it are the police unions. Are there any other corporations that's in, involved in this? Yeah, we. so when we first started the campaign, we reached out to other business leaders to sign on. And there, there are some great business leaders. Uh, Danny Meyer, who started Shake Shack. Uh, Donna Carpenter, who's the uh, chairman of the board of Burton Snowboards. There, there's a whole bunch of high-level business execs who have signed on. Yeah, I think Paul Pullman, uh, the former CEO of Unilever, signed on to it. You know, a $40 billion corporation. 
Uh, it's it, it's interesting to, when I hear you you, you, you guys talk. It's, it's and, and when I think about our conversations today, I think about like the successes of Amendment Four and the challenges around qualified immunity. I mean, this, uh, the United States Supreme Court just made some rulings and and, and has had some activity around this. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, what what strikes me is how you know active y'all are and that you, you you dig deep and you look for solutions but how do you deal with kind of that that flow that we were talking about before where you you, you can feel success one day and then you can feel a little failure the next day like what keeps you going what uh, what, what, what what keeps the, the the fight in you well we're, we are making progress so you can overturn qualified immunity uh legislatively both at the federal level and you can do it at the state level and it was proposed at the federal level as part of the george floyd justice and policing act which congress just did not act on but at the same time the states of Colorado and New Mexico and California have ended qualified immunity this, this last year. New York City has ended qualified immunity. And so I think doing it on a state by state basis will build enough momentum to get it done. Wow. Those yeah, are you can even there. overturn it. And are, are you are you and the this coalition of of business leaders and 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 activist groups are you all focusing the majority of your energy on a local level or on the federal level? Well, at it this used to point, be federal. Yeah, yeah, it used to be well, federal. Yeah. And go on, Jerry. Sorry. Yeah, now, now we're working on on states and uh you know we're coming up to the next legislative session uh for this coming year and uh we're going to be focusing on some victories you know you, you talked about ben being in dc protesting and and the protests were essential and activated a lot of people. And we also need to be able to transition from protest into changing policy, into yes. making real change. Yeah, and, from protest and to policy. We're, we're on the cusp of doing it. Yes. Wow. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, for, for a guy who was there in Washington and has been working on changing this law, it's a lot easier to protest than it is to change policy. And, but, what what we need, what we need is all the people that were involved in those protests to be helping us to change policy. Yep, so that's what we say, man. You know, when we when we when we look at the protests, we're like, listen, what we need is, is people to show up at the polls the same way, right, and make sure that they're bringing their friends and their families. But listen, I want I want to shift a little bit because. You know, you talk. You no, know, you you brought up this concept about bringing in other corporate corporate leaders to be engaged in 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 some type of advocacy work, right? And and, and maybe Chris, maybe you can answer this question. Um, are you all? Are there any plans for Ben and Jerry's to use your corporate influence to get behind the Clean Slate uh, initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that is the approach that we take, right? Is 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 using our platform and putting it in service of of you know groups and activists who have been impacted and are on the front lines of these issues. Um, and so, I think when we're at our best, that's sort of what we're doing. And and you know, we we want to take the lead from folks like you who can help us figure out the best best places for us to kind of lean in and support the work and i think in doing that we set this sort of set the standard by which other companies think about how to get engaged in these issues and so i think by ben and jerry's being really ben and jerry's and supporting you know, the, 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 the kind of progressive policy changes that we do, it, it sort of shifts a little bit the expectation. 
expectation around corporate citizenship for other corporations and other corporate actors. Let me let me apologize to you and let me apologize to our exit our audience as well because I asked a question and I didn't really set the backdrop for this, right? Because one of the things that we've been seeing happen, uh, J.P. Morgan has been a, a, a leader in this about getting corporations to uh, 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 really uh, rally around second chance hiring or fair chance hiring, uh, uh, and and part of that, you know, is uh, like addressing the issues that people like me and Neil, because we have a criminal history, how you know it's hard for us to find employment. Right. Uh, one of the things is about how we ban the box. Right. How do we remove that question from application? So to give people like me and Neil a fair chance of really showing what kind of value we can bring uh, uh, to a business, you know, instead of just having them see us check that box off and, and, and our application goes in the circular file. And then part of that process is uh, how are we clearing people's records? Uh, understanding that even something as simple as an arrest, that even though it result in a conviction, right, could actually create a barrier to employment for millions of people across the country. And I know that um, just so happened my wife, Sheena, is actually leading the Clean Slate Initiative movement, uh, the national movement, to where they're getting states to automate the record-clearing process. Right. So after a certain amount of time uh, that after a person has done their time or have been arrested uh, and nothing has happened after a certain amount of time, the states would automatically clear that person's record. It was uh, give them a clean slate, per se, that allows them to really engage in our economy by getting good jobs, by be able to even getting uh, safe and affordable housing and being able to contribute to our economy. And so I apologize to uh, uh, my audience for not explaining that first uh, uh, before posing that question uh, uh, to Chris. But, you know, it's great to know that, that Ben and Jerry's are always looking for causes that would impact people's lives in a positive way and are always looking for ways to see how you all can contribute to that. So thank you all so much for that. But I and do want to know about uh, about fair chance hiring and whether or not and can, Ben and Jerry's is part of it. Yeah, that. and Chris, before we jump into that, can I add just a little bit of context yeah. too? Because I think it goes both ways, right? When you're in relationship right. with folks where it's like, uh, we honor the fact that you want to come to people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system to get guidance and seek leadership around solutions to the pain that people are feeling. Uh, we look at it, it, it as the relationship as uh, the other way too, because one of the things that we've seen is at the beginning of this year, as we were finishing our policy platform, we talked to eight, 9,000 returning citizens and asked them what their priorities are in their lives. And, and, and getting a, a good employment was top, you know, it's constantly right there at the top. Um, across the state. So we heard that very loud and clear at the same time that we started getting all these calls from businesses and chambers of commerce saying, hey, we're, we're looking to hire people. We're looking to hire people. And you've seen this kind of lightning strike moment and we'd love any guidance or, you know, you know, that's, that's your world, man. You guys are entrepreneurs and business leaders. You know, we'd love any guidance in terms of how organizations like us can kind of be as authentic as possible in this moment to embrace the second chance employment movement that is just really beginning to take steam. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how it is around Florida, but around Vermont, you walk around and there's all these help wanted signs. There's all these job fairs. And so there's a huge businesses are having a hard time getting enough employees. And, and so it seems like this is a real opportune moment to uh, get them to start thinking about hiring people that are, you know, have been in jail that have been convicted. I mean, also, there's a bunch of states that have already banned the box. Is that correct? Yep. And we have multiple cities in Florida that has done it already. Most recently, uh, Orange County, uh, Mayor Jeffrey Demings. Uh, Jerry Demings, I said Jeffrey, yeah. but Jerry Demings. He um, was able to usher in a new policy in Orange County Just now. on September 10th. Yeah. yeah. 
that um, have banned the box on, on county applications. And in other cities, we're seeing municipalities actually extend that ban and are now saying that if you are a corporation or business and you want to contract with the, uh, the city or the county, that you would also have to remove that box on your application as well. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's all over, man. And um, we're just hoping that it continue to uh, grow momentum. Uh, and, 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 you know, it just so happened that this pandemic has created an opportunity for businesses to learn more about people like me and Neil. Right? Ben and Jerry's, for real. I mean, we may want to apply the job to work for Ben and Jerry's as taste testers or something like that, right? <laughs> We're very good yeah. at it, I, I see. You know, I, and, and I don't know. You know, I'm I'm looking at you two guys. You could be Ben and Jerry. I mean, oh, I, can, I, can oh. see, I can see you guys on top of a lid right now. Oh. I mean, that round table they're sitting at is kind oh, of a You lean in closer. Yeah. You guys are so Your good. Your head middle of the lid and that's how oh. ben and jerry started out you know granted they've now shoved us onto the back in a little thing but but we used to be on the top of the lid mm. that's awesome wow wow you got you got the great man you got the great <laughs> truly and i can't listen i can't say it enough uh uh that you know just a level of appreciation uh, that we have and, and they're returning citizens out there because you know what? Sometimes when you're in a fight, you think you're in a fight by yourself and it's very taxing. But when you can look around and see that you got some giants that's willing to throw down with you, right? The corporations that's willing to step up and, 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 and do the right thing, be on the right side of justice. It's invigorating and, 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 and it, 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 it refills that depleted tank, you know, uh, of energy and, and makes us want to keep going more and more uh, towards this utopia of justice, right? Yeah, and yeah. It, it's that moment of one of your scoopers, hey, you want a scoop? Right, it's hot, you're out there, the, the community's gathering. Uh, we're just incredibly grateful for everything y'all do. Yeah, man, thank you all so much, man. Uh, listen, we got to get up to Vermont, man. <laughs> We do. Yep. You know, I want to say I, I came away with, from with two really good ideas from from this conversation. One is Ben and Jerry's. We fill your tank. Oh, That's our like new oh, model. Okay. And, and, and and the other one is that we should come up with a new flavor called Welcome Home for yes. in honor of returning citizens oh see that man let me tell you wow that's it right there man listen Dang. that is it right there welcome home that is you know and and and, and i gotta speak to that because Ooh you know we talk i'm always in this thing about humanizing right when we're able to humanize people right then we're able to actually have a much better approach to dealing with issues right uh, that we that we're faced with but when we're able to if we're able to dehumanize them, then, you know, when you dehumanize a person that, that has a criminal history or is incarcerated, then it's very easy to overlook the, the deplorable conditions that they're in. It's easy to overlook us caging even children as if they, like they were animals or locking people up in solitary confinement or even, you ready for this, even beating people down, all right, having law enforcement beat people down is easy to overlook the injustice because that person has a record. And you see, you no, know, some folks do that. Mm -hmm. Whenever they're the shooting, the first thing they want to say, but he had a record. Mm -hmm. But who cares? What? That record was 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And even if the record was recent, that still does not justify treating this person less than a human being. So when you say, welcome home, Right. That is such a humanizing statement that is saying that I see your humanity and I understand that you've been away because you've made a mistake. But I personally want to welcome you back into society. Here's the voter registration form. Fill that out. Right. Well, I'll tell you Make guys sure to, you vote. to stay deep for one second. Yeah. If you think about if you can that, that mission of humanizing uh -huh. people who have been incarcerated, people who have uh -huh. criminal records. 
think about what that can do for the rest of society. Wow. Right? Yeah. You, you start that ball rolling, right? Yes, and the hate, yes. that division, that we don't see yeah. each other's people thing that yeah. was so endemic everywhere. Oh, come yep. on. And we could I'd all, eat that ice hey, cream We could have day, ice cream man. together, right? <laughs> Here we go. My, 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 me and my blackness and Neil and his whiteness. All right. And we could come together with eating ice cream and what you got, the Justice oh, remix. My, my and new I got favorite. My strawberry shortcake. <laughs> Thank you, Ben and Jerry, for coming on the show. And we're looking to connect with you all uh, real soon because uh, we're doing and we're still doing the HBCU Ready, Set, Vote bus tour that's going on all the way to November 29th, where we'll culminate it at the Orange Orange Classic, the uh, the 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 classic yep. uh, game between FAMU and Bethune Cookman at Camper World Stadium in Orlando, Florida. The Ben and Jerry Scoopers are going to be out in force. So if you come into the Classic, make sure you look for that Ben and Jerry's tent and the FRC Let My People Vote, Free to Vote bus, because we're going to be together. We're joined at the hip. Make sure you come out. Ben and Jerry's, Chris, thank you so much, y'all. Thank y'all you. have a great evening. We really appreciate y'all. Thank you so Bye-bye, much. Bye-bye, you guys.